Welcome to Sober Solutions. We are a weekly recovery podcast, not affiliated with any particular 12-step or recovery program. However, you may hear us mention them. My name is Jason, and I'm an alcoholic and addict. My name is Chris, and I'm an alcoholic and addict. My name is Ben. I'm an alcoholic and addict. Hey, guys. Welcome to Sober Solutions podcast. This is episode zero. We finally made it. How are you guys doing today? Pretty good. Long weekend, but I'm excited to be here. It was beautiful weather out too, wasn't it? Yeah. It was uh, golfing weather. Golfing weather, exactly. Uh, I'm getting getting the itch. I'm getting the itch. (laughs) Well, I definitely can't shoot as good as you guys. I know that for sure, but I'll have to uh, embarrass myself on the links one of these days. That'll be good. That's why they have scrambles. (laughs) Does putt-putt count? That's where everyone starts, so. (laughs) Awesome. Well, just to uh, let the viewers and listeners uh, know who we are, my name's Jason, and I'm an alcoholic and addict. Uh, My sobriety date is July 27th, 2020, which makes it uh, just over seven and a half months that I've been sober. Um, My primary drug of choice is alcohol, but uh, I'm pretty much a a more is better kind of guy. Um, with me on this journey, uh, we have Christopher V and Ben R and Chris W, a.k.a. Matrix. Um, Chris, do you just want to introduce yourself a little bit? Yeah, my name's, like he said, Christopher V. My wife calls me Christopher, so I've taken on this alias. Um, my sobriety date was uh, on August 1st. I had a little slip up, so it is now on November 24th. Um, my drug of choice is opiates. Um, although I am kind of with Jason on, you know, anything more, I am in the more category. Um, yeah, and I primarily do Narcotics Anonymous through this process. Awesome, awesome, Chris. And we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about that today. Yeah. Ben, do you want to introduce yourself? Of course. I'm Ben, I'm an alcoholic, um, an addict. But uh, yeah, my drug of choice was alcohol exclusively. Um, but in the same vein, yeah, more, more was better until it wasn't. Um, so yeah, I'm doing AA. Uh, my sobriety date is July 28th. And so that puts me right, right with you, Jason. It's about seven, seven and a half months so far. Awesome. And this, this time, I am glad to be one day older than you. <laughs> um, but, uh, let's, let's go to Chris. Um, you know, you, you just did mention that you had a relapse and, um, you know, we, we all went to rehab together and can you just talk to us a little bit about what that was like for you? Uh, you know, coming out of rehab and then, you know, having that relapse and coming back into the rooms. Oh man, you sent all these questions. I don't think that one hit there. Um, <laughs> no, that's good. So I was working a program. I had therapists. I did all the things that people suggested. Um, and I think I, the one thing I didn't do well was completely be honest with my sponsors and my network. Um, I wasn't planning on using. Uh, I was actually planning for a while. I have this house upstate that I go to, uh, my family goes to, it's a ski house. And um, I had stuff stored up there and i actually was just in a mood to play poker and i've put all these uh we'll call them securities on my financials so that i can't get a large sum of money at any time so in order to get around that i was planning on using those to sell and basically go play poker for the day i used to play I don't even know if you would call it semi pro, whatever. I was playing uh, somewhat professionally at a time. Kind of like I, Bond in, in uh, Quantum of Solace there? Yeah, for, for that much money, we'll say. <laughs> Not at all. Um, I don't think I lasted 10 minutes with them in front of me. So it was uh, humbling. It was embarrassing. I, I remember I called you. I called a lot of people. Uh, and that was the first thing my sponsor had me do was be honest with everyone that was in my network and uh, 
you know, for the most part, everyone was very welcoming back. It was supportive. Um, if you're around the rooms long enough, like there's very few people that haven't had this part of their experience, whether it's them or the people around them. So everyone's well aware of how to support people in that um, state. Yeah, that's that's a really great point. And, you know, I, I've been there myself. Um, I might have a little over seven and a half months sober now, but I've been at this for 10 years. And I just really want to acknowledge you for coming right back into the rooms. Um, every time I relapsed, it was a struggle for me. And fortunately, um, I haven't done that yet. Um, but that's a yet for me to, to relapse this time. I, I think because of the work that I've done with my sponsor, the work that I've done in the steps of Alcoholics Anonymous, um, the fellowship that I've grown has really helped me tremendously. So I, I appreciate your honesty with us. Um, yeah. Ben, you know, can, can you tell us a little bit about um, what that honesty, that cornerstone of honesty means to you and your program? For me, honesty is, it, it, it is a cornerstone. If I'm not being honest, you know, like what Chris said, you know, it, it's it's just one thing to be honest, you know, dishonest with other people, but that really for me comes from, you know, not being honest with myself. And you know, if I can lie to myself, I can lie to anybody. And so honesty is, it is it is the cornerstone. Um, and I found that it's you know t taking that honesty into uh, all of my affairs. So it's not just about being honest about you know not drinking. It's being honest about every single uh, interaction that I have. Uh, am I doing the next right thing? Uh, so yeah, so the, the honesty is is key. And, and and at the end of the day, you know, there's it's just you know us and our you know it's just ourselves. You, there's no nobody else. And if you can square with yourself that I was honest in all of my affairs, or at least I tried to be, and if I wasn't completely forthright, it was because I you know. Want that I didn't want to hurt somebody to didn't, didn't want to hurt somebody, you know. That's that's really all uh, all I try to do every day in terms of honesty. That's great, and you know, you mentioned about being honest in all our affairs. Um, you know, for the listeners, can you talk to me a little bit about how you do that? How you bring your program into all aspects of your life? Um, whether you follow the 12 steps of AA or NA or whatever program you choose, um, smart recovery, whatever it is, um, what's it like to to live a sober life? Uh, well, uh, yeah, so I'm doing AA and um, currently on step 10. And it's, you know, 10, 11, 12, as they say, they're the maintenance steps. And those are the ones that we you know, we live, live every single day, um, or I, I'm, I'm doing, doing this program, li going to live every single day. And so it, it's, it's really been a, it's a, it's another learning experience. Every single step has been a learning experience. Uh, and there's, there hasn't been one yet that I've gotten to and, and instantly understood it. It's taken me time to digest it and be mindful of it. And what does it really mean? Like, so, you know, doing step 10, you know, the, there's a, there's a million apps out there, you know, 10 step app. And, and, and I don't think I've scored higher than a 70 yet. And, you know, and, and cause I asked you like a series of questions and it's amazing when you think back over your day, you know, were you honest? Did you, do you owe someone an apology? Did you say something? Did I say something out of fear? You know, just simple things like that. Did I hold a resentment? Any kind of resentment it doesn't matter. It could be the guy that cut me off in traffic. It could be, you know, a family member who's who I feel has done something to wrong me or a friend. It, it, those are the things that I have to look at in the moment. It, you know, work work on you know looking at in the moment so that I don't carry that resentment. Um, so so yeah, it, it's carrying to all my affairs is is really been. The, the hardest part, you know, I, I thought not drinking was going to be the hardest part. You know, I'm, I'm in the midst of a divorce. I'm, you know, I see my, my, my girls on a limited basis, not building a, not getting a resentment out of that is, has been, has been incredibly trying. Yeah. I see that. Chris, do you want to add anything? You know, how, how do you really uh, live 
honesty or live your program throughout your entire life. I know all three of us kind of live all separate kinds of lives. Um, so just tell the listeners about you. Yeah, I mean, I, it's tough because I have a lot of external reasons and I'm trying to find the internal more to be here. Uh, I do have two kids. One of the main reasons I want to get clean and sober is to be as good of a father as I can be to them. Um, family is very important to me. And what I was doing was not making me the best uh, version of myself. So as far as living honestly, I think that every day I'm striving to love myself um, as much as I can. And in order to do that, I have to talk to people daily. And through that, you know, a lot of people that I talk to know me so well now that they are able to call me on my BS without me knowing it. So I, I think that it's really about communicating and Ben hit it on the head. Like if I'm not honest with myself, <clears throat> I mean, we could all as addicts and alcoholics BS anyone around us. We're professional, you know, I don't want to curse, but BSers. Yeah. And we can we can sell snow to an Eskimo. So it really starts with being honest with yourself. And that's what I do when I meditate. That's what I do when I pray. Um, I definitely have religion in my life. So I use those resources to get honest with myself. Got that. Got that. It, you know, you, you touched on a lot of great things. Um, one of them was this uh, journey of self-love. Um, and as I said earlier, we all went to rehab together um, in southern New Jersey. Uh, that's where we all met, where we all became friends. And for me, I went into rehab with uh, an agenda. Um, I'm, I'm very type A like that. I love my lists and my checklists. And, you know, for me, I wanted to get sober. I wanted to uh, get on this journey of self-love and self-discovery. Um, and, and that's something that you mentioned. So it's, it's really important to me because as I've gone through the steps, as I've worked with other people, I've noticed how my sense of self has improved tremendously. And, you know, that was the biggest learning for me from rehab. Um, in fact, I'm, I'm not sure if we were in the same group or not when I asked this, but I asked the guys in the room, how do you love yourself? And we went around and had an entire therapy session about it to really talk about what does self-love mean? So Chris, you know, from your experience in, in rehab, what was your biggest takeaway? What was your biggest learning? That's a good question. So I didn't touch on this before, but this is my second uh, rehab. So I was actually, you know, I say clean and sober for three years. During that period, I just wasn't using opiates. Uh, I did drink randomly. I wasn't fully abstinent. Um, and I went to, uh, meetings and was, was working steps. And that's probably ultimately what led me to a relapse. Um, I felt very hypocritical, but the biggest, uh, thing I learned from rehab the first time was that it doesn't matter if you're rich, poor, black, white, orange, yellow, whatever, gay, straight, like trees, whatever you, you know, whatever your thing is, addiction doesn't discriminate. I mean, I, I remember I put off for years going to rehab because I thought that, you know, I was better than, or I was wealthier than, or because I own this, or I did this, or I had a job or didn't have it, whatever it was, you know, I don't belong in there. And that's a hundred percent, not the case. Um, and for people that haven't gone, I think that's something that they need to hear is that you have Fortune 500 CEOs that go to rehab. I mean, the first time I went, there was two NFL players there. There was a guy who owned like 35 um, clothing stores. I won't mention the store, but, you know, you had wealthy and then you also had people living under bridges. So it definitely doesn't discriminate. Yeah, that, that's a good point. I, I, I really like that. And I'm sure uh, that guy who owned the 35 stores appreciates that. <laughs> ben, um, you know, you uh, came in a little bit after Chris and I, uh, but what was your biggest takeaway? It was that 
absolutely it it doesn't discriminate because it, it, you know addiction is a disease and it didn't matter that uh, just like chris said i you know i i had benchmarks you know and and they were they were uh, they were vain they were um you know am i am i the guy under the bridge and just because i wasn't the guy under the bridge i thought i i was i, I didn't have a problem um and then that's just not not the case my my biggest takeaway from rehab was that was exactly that 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 an addict is an addict and it takes an addict to get through to another addict uh, that that's what i found in the newcomer meetings at, in rehab and that's what i found in the rooms of a since since i started going there and you can change the faces i guarantee you if we went back to rehab right now we could find a version of ourselves there and and i think that's just because addiction knows no bounds addiction is is simply something you know how, i don't know how many times i've heard it the, the problem is not the drinking or the drug and the problem is in between the years it's a it's a it's a cognitive issue and and so you know my biggest takeaway was that we are all on the same side we're all on the same team and that really for me was was a big you know just touching on that the idea of self love that you that you hit you know, self-love was not something that I really understood. I did not have a very high opinion of myself before I went to rehab. And I found that in rehab. So it, it was a confidence and a self-esteem that, that, that wasn't present. And being around like-minded people that were suffering from the same issues that I was, uh, was, was probably the most comforting thing that I had been through in life, at the, you know, up until that point. That's that's another great point, and uh, you know personally, I think they broke the mold with you there, Ben. But, <laughs> uh, you know, so you you, you were talking about uh, what I'm going to call the fellowship of of recovery. You know, I I, I was just talking to uh, a new sponsee tonight about how if I illustrated my disease, I would be the small little mouse, and my disease would be the 600 pound silverback gorilla. And I cannot take it on by myself, you know, and even though I started lifting a little bit in, in rehab, you know, that's where I started getting my fitness back. I cannot take it on by myself, but with my sponsor, with you guys, with the people in the rooms, strength is in numbers. And, you know, you were talking about how you are in the AA fellowship and really working on your 10th step. Um, talk to us a little bit about what that's been like for you to go through Alcoholics Anonymous, to work through those steps. Um, do you have a sponsor? Do you have sponsees? What? What? Tell us a little bit more about it. Yeah, my uh, I, uh, my my home group is a uh, Sunrise Semester down based out of Philly, which I found on Zoom. Uh, you know, I know we'll touch on that at a later date. But um, the, the but my, my I have a sponsor. Uh, got in my very first meeting, um, and and it. it Going through AA and going through the steps has been the most. I, I can't. There aren't enough adjectives for me to describe what it's what it's meant to me. But I think the 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 thing that I've taken away from AA is that, and this happened a couple of times when when I would call my sponsor with a particular issue that I, a personal issue that I was going through, he always turned me back to the book. He didn't necessarily. That wasn't that he, he cares about me deeply as an individual, but the problem to my solution or the solution to my problem was not some piece of advice that was going to be this, you know, this particular nugget, you know, to, to that particular, um, you know, th there wasn't going to be one piece of advice. It was, did you, did you, did you pray on it? Did you read the promises? Did you read page 417 about acceptance? And every time that happened, it happened probably two or three times before I realized, Oh, he just keeps turning me back to the book because all the answers to my problems are in this book because my problem is my mentality. And this book that's been around since 1939 has been, you know, it has the answers for my particular disease, at least the way I have it. Um, so, so yeah, so AA for me has been just an, an unbelievable, it's given me a second chance that I didn't know I needed. Um, and, and so while I don't have sponsees yet, um, I, I cannot wait to have, uh, sponsees because, 
you know, the 12 step is, you know, carrying the message to other alcoholics and addicts because that's the only way that's how I, that's how I've been sober for seven and a half months because other people who have been through it before me taught me. It's my responsibility now to help, help others learn the same lessons I learned. So yeah, it's been a, uh, it's been a godsend. That's great. Now um, I'm not sure if you, if you mentioned this, but the book that you're talking about is Alcoholics Anonymous or also yeah. known as the big book. Yes, um, that is the, the literature for AA. Um, for those who are in NA um, or Narcotics Anonymous, uh, it's called um, basic The Basic Text. Thanks, Chris. Um, Chris, I know that you have a sponsor as well. Uh, talk to us a little bit about how you chose your sponsor. Uh, I actually just changed my sponsor. Um, and that wasn't because of something he was doing or not doing. Uh, we just have really conflicting schedules and we were meeting at just bad times. So I was either leaving work during the day or he was half asleep and he would meet after he's a truck driver. So he would meet me after one of his shifts. And I don't know, I mean, just driving for 12, 14 straight hours, I could imagine not, you know, it would be hard to focus, I would say. So we had one day, which was Saturday that we could connect. And, you know, if you have two kids, that's the one day that I'm kind of required to be home. So he actually set me up with uh, another guy. Um, we've met a bunch of times and I just uh, never even really thought to ask him. And we are starting over uh, just because he wants to start from scratch. So this is actually the third time in seven months that I've started from step one, which is okay. I'm not in a rush. Um, I was on step four, which, you know, is a, a moral inventory. Uh, you know, I won't, I won't go into the specifics of the steps right now. I'm sure that's a later date or something, but yeah. Yeah. So I'm, I'm basically back to the beginning. So your answer is how did I pick a sponsor? The original sponsor that I picked was based on attraction, um, just personalities that didn't work out so well because we were just two good friends. The second guy, I just really respected how he talked and I really respected the message that he was sharing of experience, strength and hope and I was drawn to that. So that was the sponsor that was the driver. And, um, you know, I still talk to him a lot. So he's definitely not out of my life. He's just not my current sponsor. Yeah. It, you know, I, I've changed sponsors um, as well. And now being a sponsor, I really get the, the notion of how all sponsors are temporary. And you know, in, in your case, when you were talking about how you had to change because schedules just weren't lining up, you know, that could be a really anxiety producing event is to change your sponsor, right? And so I think the more that people really understand that all sponsors are temporary and if we're able to, you know, find the best fit that we can for us, to take us through the steps, that's what I'm looking for. You know, you know what's funny about that? What? I talked in group for, I don't know, probably two months about that before I just brought it up to him. And they're like, Chris, just stop talking about it. You know, just talk, just bring it up. And then my therapist is like, so you didn't do it tonight? And I was like, oh, I don't know. And she's like, no, you're doing it tonight. So I literally <laughs> like walked out. I called him. He's like, yeah, our schedules really aren't aligning. And he was just like, I think I have someone that you really like. So it was the most not. So you're right. I had built up this whole fake scenario in my head about how I was going to let this guy down. And he basically just agreed with me and found me a, a new guy that was more aligned within my lifestyle or my you know schedule. Isn't it amazing how we do that? You know, whether it's a time. sponsor or even coming back, coming into the rooms for the first time, coming back to the rooms after a relapse. I know for me, I would, I would build up this anxiety so high that it would, it would stop me from taking the action. And then when I did, I was kind of disappointed in how nonchalant everybody was. You know, I'm like, hi, I'm Jason. I have day one. And they're like, welcome back. Get to work. And I'm like, that's it? 
really? <laughs> but that's what that's what helps me. And that's what I think is really great about recovery. Whatever program you you do, whatever rooms you go into, whether they be virtual or in person, um, that fellowship is is so key and so crucial. Uh, at least to my program, it's been um, great. So guys, um, you know, I know, and I know that we've talked about this before, uh, sobriety is not easy. So what's been your biggest challenge, either getting sober the first time or staying sober for now? Who wants to go? Chris? I'll go. Well, like I talked about before, I had a interruption in my uh, sobriety. Um, we, call that a we call that a relapse. Is that what you were going to say? <laughs> yeah, that was what I was going to say. <laughs> it was ahead, funny. Tell today was, I, I, was just at a, <laughs> I was just at a meeting. Well, I first of all, I call it a relapse. Depending who you talk to, certain people call it interruptions. And sometimes they just don't want to change their sobriety date. But we won't get into the opinions of other, you know everyone's uh, sobriety date. But anyway. I'm not short. I'm vertically challenged. That's what <laughs> Oh, man. So Jason brought up having a type A personality, making lists. Um, I as well do that. I need to get everything done. I feel like I am relied on by a lot of people to do things. Um, I also feel like a common thing, a common theme in my life is I feel like, whereas if I ask these people for help, they're there for me. But I feel like I need to do everything myself. So when I say that, I need to fix my job. I need to fix my finances. I need to fix my relationship with my wife. I needed to fix my parenting skills. And I needed to be the best sober person and um, recovery person that I could be and all within a couple months after getting out of rehab. So I think my biggest challenge was managing my expectations with getting out and accomplishing all these things in a time frame that wasn't conducive to accomplishing all these things. And I put all this external pressure, or I, I wouldn't even say external, sorry, internal pressure on myself to do this. And when I wasn't going as fast as I could, whether my relationship wasn't, you know, back to the day we met and we were, you know, texting each other every day, I love you. Or it was, you know, I, I wasn't CEO of a company I just started at a month ago or whatever it was, I would feel disappointed. And um, sitting in that feeling was not very helpful to my recovery, which through that whole process, I wasn't putting at the front of all these things. So me not putting it in the forefront ended up, you know, was the first thing to go. So I think that, that I'm, I'm whole gonna, uh, time frame. I'm going to have to start going before you because you're just stealing my answers. So <laughs> the, um, yeah, my big challenge has been wanting people on my timeline and that's just not possible. It, it's, you know, you know, it, I heard a million times it takes 10 years, you know, what, what, what happened in 10 years is going to be fixed in 10 days. And I'm ready for everybody to kind of be over the, the I'm ready for everyone to get over their shock and awe. Well, the, the truth of the matter is, is it was, it, it was a lot of shock and awe for people. I was surprised that I was in, in rehab on, you know, I went in on a Friday on Saturday morning, I tried to convince him to let me out. And Sunday afternoon, it was hi, I'm Ben, I'm an alcoholic. You know, so I didn't even know I I didn't think I was supposed to be there, but you know, so now getting out, going through divorce, moving back with my parents, it's leaving the people with a ton of questions, and it's impossible to answer those questions, you know, in in you know in a couple of days time, and so you know to Chris's point, my expectations of what people, where other people should be have been completely unreasonable. And, and so it's, it, it hasn't been that, that part hasn't challenged me staying sober. So, you know, for me, staying sober is it, I, I don't want to go back to that. I, I, you know, it, it's, I remember what that felt like 
And even on my worst day in the last seven and a half months, hasn't been even close to as bad as my best day drinking. So, but, but it's, again, it's not about the drink of the drug for me. It's about the mentality. And my mentality has been, come on, guys, get on my level. Let's go. And it's just in classic addict mentality. I want what I want and I want it now. And, and damn you if you don't give it to me. But yeah, it's, it's, so stop stealing my answers, Chris. Yeah, <laughs> I, I feel that I want that right now, that, that, you know, instant gratification. Um, as I mentioned earlier, I, I started, you know, really getting into fitness more uh, in rehab. Um, you know, my workout buddy, Chris, you know, we were in the gym almost every day. Um, I was, I was impressed with those, uh, shoulder presses, <laughs> <laughs> you know, I mean, after 30 days of working out in a gym, you're not going to see the results that you want. You know, I, I want that fitness, you know, cover of men's fitness physique in 30 days. And that's sure as hell not going to happen. Right. You know, this is a process and, and that's what I really had to take on. You know, for me, I had to learn to re uh, establish my own expectations and really understand what one day at a time really meant and how to put that into uh, effect. You know, for me, the, my, my greatest challenge of my sobriety has been relationships. Uh, it's, it's been one of the biggest triggers that I've had. And really, whether that be romantic relationships uh, with a partner or a potential partner, with my father, uh, with my sisters, with people at work, I set such a high bar of expectation for myself that I set an even higher bar for people in my life. And what I've discovered over the last seven and a half months is that I do that because I love to be disappointed because when I'm disappointed, I drink and I drug. And so I'm in that hamster wheel of, I, I don't want to be disappointed by people, but when I get disappointed by people, oh, see, I knew you were going to disappoint me. So I'm just going to go get messed up, you know, and, and just stay in that addiction. I think um, your addiction likes you to be disappointed, not you. My addiction likes me to be disappointed. Uh, you're, you're absolutely right. You're absolutely that that 600 pound silverback gorilla. It, you're, that's a great point. You know, I have to I had to figure out who I was again. You know, I had to figure out who Jason really is. And, and that took a lot of self-discovery. It took a lot of questions. It took a lot of, you know, really thorough investigation. Um, and, you know, it, it's led to me having an extremely big life right now. You know, if, if I want to turn the, turn the coin and say, you know, the, the best things that have happened to me since getting sober uh, is that I have friends now. Before, when I was in my active addiction, I knew a lot of people. I had acquaintances all over the place, but that's because I was paying the tab. You know, I, I was buying my friends because I hated myself so much. If I paid you enough, if I bought dinner, if I bought the shots, if I bought the drugs, then you would hang out with me. But when I found myself living in New York City and I couldn't even buy a combination dinner from the Chinese menu and was calling people to get help. No one was around. And now I have people that if I miss a meeting, I get text messages. Hey, where you at? You okay? My family and I have really reconnected to a point where my father trusts me with a key to his house again. You know, it, it's, it's really that, that fellowship that I've been able to create. That is probably the best thing that's happened to me in sobriety. I, not, not just that, but really starting school again, you know, going into a clinical psychology program, doing well at work, you know, having money again. I, I was astounded about how much money I was spending on drugs and alcohol. It was crazy. Almost as much as you guys spend on golf. So <laughs> I hope my wife doesn't listen to this. <laughs> But you know, how about you guys? What, what's been the best thing to happen to you since you got sober? I'll, I'll right. let Ben take this one first, but real quick, I think it's funny that most of our answer, answers revolved around other people. 
a, lot, a common theme is when we get out of rehab or you go start working a program is everybody expects everyone else to be in a program in recovery or with a therapist too. And we have this common language and we talk a certain way and we say, I relate to that. And we, yep. <laughs> you know, it's funny, but it's true. And we know how to interact and talk about our feelings, but then you go into the real world and you've changed, but everyone else is still three, four, six months back from when you left. And that's another uh, conversation, I guess, for another day. But I just was thinking about that when Ben was sharing, when you were sharing, when I was talking. So all I have to say to that is I identify. I identify. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> all right, Ben, what's the best thing for you? The, the best thing for me is that self-confidence that never existed before exists every single day. Um, it's, you know, th there are a number of material things that have happened. The, the money thing is, it's funny you mentioned it, like, like I, it's kind of shocking to see the money in my savings account. Like I literally spent years living paycheck to paycheck because it was, you know, we paid the bills, we paid the mortgage and, and then the rest of it was. I'm going to spend 150, 200 bucks a week on alcohol, which, you know, is, is, you know, I know it pales in comparison to some other <laughs> habits, but it's, it, for me, and you know, where, where I was living, that was, it was a huge chunk of change. And so, you know, so yeah, the material things, it's all, all the cliches are true, you know, sometimes quickly, sometimes slowly, everything come, everything, you know, comes back. But the, the best thing that's happened to me is that I, you know, to steal a line from you, Jason, is, is, you know, the, the you know, I, I found who, who I am, you know, I, I don't have to be anybody. I'm, I'm the most authentic version of myself that I've ever been, which is really disappointing because I thought I was pretty self-aware and I thought I was a pretty genuine individual and, and I wasn't, I wasn't even close to that because I was hiding this massive secret. Um, so yeah, it, it's, it's been a, uh, it's, it's, it's material things, but for me, the the spiritual growth that I've experienced is, you know, I can't put a dollar value on that one. Yeah, as MasterCard says, priceless, right? <laughs> By the way, MasterCard is not a sponsor of this podcast yet, but uh, yeah. So, so as we wrap up, um, you know, I, I, the two things I really want to talk about is uh, the first. Uh, newcomers. Um, and, and for me, I think we're all newcomers, you know, we're all under a year in sobriety. Um, but what kind of advice do you have for people who might be just coming in, might be hearing about some of this stuff for the first time, might be just coming back? Ben? Um, the, it's really simple. Don't pick up and go to meetings. You know, th th that's everything else for me has worked itself out. There's too many, if you start bringing in every individual problem that you have and look and, and hoping that the room figures out, you know, that how to solve that problem. One of the very first meetings I was in, somebody said, you know, when you take you, you take your crap and you throw it in the middle of the floor, you're walking away with 99% of it because the program is not here to solve your individual problem. The program is here to solve the problem of addiction. And how it how it affects you personally, and you learn that in the rooms. It's the only place I could have learned it. If you find someplace else, else learning, tremendous. God bless you. But I've found it in the rooms, and and that's that's it. it it's it doesn't get it again. Another cliche: a simple program for complicated people. It's not hard. They put the steps on big big pieces of paper and slap them on the wall, and all you got to do is <laughs> do them one through twelve. Like it's not even like it's that many steps. Just do the steps in order, do them with a sponsor, get in the rooms and don't pick up. Well, I asked for one piece of advice for the newcomers, but I think that was 12, um, but really good ones. Really, really good ones. Chris, what do you got for us? I think Ben just recited how it works. Um, <laughs> <laughs> that's for another later episode, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> 
No, I, I do like what classical ben stylings of Ben R. Reading how yeah. it works. Alcoholics. It's, it's amazing that when I met him the first time, I don't like. I don't think he knew what left, right, up, or down was, and even knew what the word alcoholic meant. And now he could probably recite the big book, you know, front and back, but. He could barely it's, tell us what his name was. Exactly. <laughs> I'm trying to figure out how to make the next smoke break. <laughs> <laughs> or how to how to borrow smoke. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um new advice for the newcomer. There's a lot, you know. It's it's funny because I'm four plus years into this process. You're 10 years and we're still newcomers. Um but because of that, we do have good advice. I think, you know, we have struggled. Uh, I think my one first piece of advice is everyone's recovery is in a straight line. You know, I hate the saying relapse is a part of recovery because it doesn't have to be, you know, if everyone took the right suggestions, uh, for you and everyone and you did everything that was right for you to recover, you wouldn't relapse, but it's hard to find that process because it's not the same for everyone. So I think what the first piece entails being patient with yourself. Um, we talked about wanting everything at once. Uh, that's both internal growth, external growth. You know, you're not going to become you, like Ben said before, you can't fix 10 years of drinking in 10 days. Um, and a lot of that has to do with the internal, you know, I, I'm big on fixing the internal, you know, everyone today just didn't drink or to use drugs. Like that was pretty easy, but you know, yeah, certain people, and even if I don't use, I'm still an asshole. So until I fix that, I haven't really grown into a recovered person. Um, and that's what I'm working on now, how to be the best version of myself. Like Ben said before, he's right now discovering who he is. He's being the best version of himself. That's what we're all on this journey for. Um, other than that, yeah, I think if I just read how it works, I think uh, that's that's the next piece of advice. So, but I, yeah, I, I would always go back to be patient with yourself and understand that the people around you don't have people to talk to all the time and they don't have a therapist and they haven't gone away for 30 days. And you know, that it's, it's very easy to say, Oh, you don't trust me. You don't believe in me. You don't this, you don't that, but they're stuck back in when you were using lying and stealing, you know? So yeah. we have to be understanding on that front too. Yeah. We're very resourceful when it comes to getting our drug of choice. Um, but when it comes to our recovery, we, we put up walls. I, I put up walls. I, you know, I, I, that, that's one thing, you know, if I had a piece of advice would be to talk about I, as in myself, because this isn't Ben's program. This isn't Matrix's program. This isn't Chris's program. This is Jason's program. And really trust the process. That's one thing that kept me struggling for 10 years is that I thought I knew better than I knew better than the book. I knew better than my sponsor. I knew better than the people in the rooms. You know, I, Chris, I, I really relate to what you were saying about trying to be, you know, captain recovery. You know, I want to look good on the outside, even though I feel like shit on the inside, you know, trust the process, know that getting a sponsor is really important. And when they are taking you through the steps, they will only give you the road to recovery that they've followed themselves. As a sponsor, that's the only thing I can do is make suggestions on how to get what I got. So I think, you know, newcomers, you know, they say they're the most important person in the room. I think every single alcoholic and addict in the room is important because we're all newcomers. I, I really subscribe to the 24 hours a day. I subscribe to one day at a time. And the person who is the most sober today is the person who woke up first because we all have 24 hours. I, I unfortunately have a friend who uh, would have been celebrating almost two years this month and now has two days and it can happen to anybody, you know? So 
Trust the process. Trust the process. Well, guys, hey, it's been a pleasure to get this uh, inaugural, um, well, I guess not inaugural, but our first episode off the ground. Um, Do you, you want know, to call like me ribbons? Said, yeah, that'd be great. Matrix, get us some big scissors, all right? <laughs> <laughs> there you go. But uh, thank you so much. And uh, thank you to the listeners. Um, you know, each and every one of our uh, episodes are dedicated to those still sick and suffering inside and outside of the rooms, as well as the alcoholic or addict who is going to pick up for the first time tonight. So thank you so much and have a great night. Thanks, boys. We appreciate your liking and subscribing to our podcast. If you liked what you heard today and would like to support our podcast, feel free to Venmo a dollar to our virtual basket at Sober Solutions Podcast. We want to hear from you too. If you have a comment, question, topic, or would like to come on the show, find us on Instagram, Facebook, or YouTube at Sober Solutions Podcast. Or you can shoot us an email to Sober Solutions Podcast at gmail.com. Find us on Apple Podcasts and Spotify. And if you like what you've heard, make sure to subscribe, rate, and review the show.